Hey guys, Mr. Studebaker here. In this segment, we're going to cover Cub Cadet 1 inch spindles and the bearings. This is a factory setup, and as you can see, there's all kinds of clearance in the bearing. One might think that. Once you crack it open, you begin to have a different understanding. Let me spin this off, and we'll have a look at the side of what's going on. First look, you can see that the inner race. That's this guy right here is wiggling pretty hard on the shaft. There's a lot of clearance on that. When you clean the shaft off, you can see exactly what's going on here. Being 15 years old, this thing has had its share of troubles. There's a ledge on here where the bearing was actually, the inner race was spinning on this and wearing it down. So my fixes were in order to try to find out if I could stop the inner race from spinning, which was to use a Detroit press on it. The Detroit press consists of taking a center punch like this and hammering a bunch of divots all over the shaft to raise the metal up to bring it back to the outside diameter of the shaft and or a little bit more. So when you put the bearing on, it's now a semi-press fit onto the shaft and to keep it from spinning. I did that, ran it, put it together, checked it a couple weeks later, found out that the race was still spinning on there. So I went, that sucks, let's try something different. So in my arsenal of things done in the past when I was an engine builder, was an arsenal of one inch ID valve spring spacers. They fit under nice and easy. And what that allowed is to preload the bearing. So I would put, a, put the spacer on the outside Screw the screw the bolt and the assembly back down and I would fine-tune it to where there was minimal wiggle uh, A little preload on the inside of the races. So I'm pushing the race that way So it would lock it down to a degree and then in hopes of that would stop the whole assembly from spinning uh, Yeah, I ran that test yet. That didn't work out too good either. So I went well I guess I got to do it and that would be to put in a solid spacer to capture both inner races so that they would meet up hard on the inside bearing retainer. I didn't really want to do that. I've done it in the past. It works good, but it takes a lot of setup because you have to assemble it, put it together, tear it apart, do the whole setup on that. Well, I wanted to do something a little different because, you know, I'm a little different. And this is what I've done. In Kaiser's setup, I used one of the coil springs that were associated with these little spacers. What that allows, and I found out that this coil spring, which happens to be one inch ID, and it fits nicely on the races, is that it compresses about three sixteenths of an inch. It puts a little preload on everything, which is a bonus. So when you compress this down, uh, recaps a little bit, the hubs are a press fit on the outside and the loose fit on the inside, which is completely opposite for how bearings are supposed to be set up. They're supposed to be a press fit on the inside and a, a semi-slip fit on the outside. I'm good with that. This, this is the way this cheap setup went. So when you compress the spring, it takes this inside race and puts it out. Well, I'd really, I'm, I'm good with that, but I wanted to go a little bit better. I wanted to preload the inside. So, you adjust the spacers because these are of various thicknesses and you bolt everything together and you continually adjusting the spacers until the preload is now on the inside. So it's going to take and squish this whole inner race assembly down where the bearings are now loaded on the outside and that will eliminate the rock of the wheel. I'm good with that. So I decided to run it. Um, the one caveat to this whole deal is that when you use a coil spring, is that when you throw a grease in it, the spring acts as um, a pump for the grease. So it'll move the grease all the way out to the outside or the inside, depending on what side of the tractor it's on. And it always keeps the grease in a bearing until it runs itself or dry where it cannot pump any more grease. So the whole premise of this, setting the preload, is to find out whether or not your bearings are wearing.
Because you got to know whether your bearings are wearing. If you got it set at a certain distance and then they start wiggling, then you know the bearings are wearing off. Well, that's what I found out on this guy. This is Kaiser. And, and you can see that there's quite a bit of movement in the wheel, which leads me to believe that the bearing is getting kind of old. So we're going to have a little inspection on what's happening here and see what's going on. I wanted to do a little bit of investigation first to find out whether the bearing shot or not, or there are a few other things going on because I got to find out whether the inside race is spinning or not. So I'm going to turn this guy off. And you can see how I've already got a spacer in there already. We'll take that guy out. Hey, wait a minute. You see that? That's a little bit. Hmm. Interesting. Back to the inspection. So, what I'm looking at is this. You can see all the iterations that were done on this. There's, you know, you can see the Michigan press or Detroit press put on there. It's not shiny. So that means the races aren't spinning. I would say that the coil springs are a success in here. And I want to get back to this. Because that is interesting. Let's see. Let's bring you over here. Get a good look at this guy. Hmm. You know, that was flat when it went in. This has been in here for about maybe a year and a half. And you know what? With that thing being bent like that, I bet that last couple of runs on Kaiser kind of bent this thing out where the bearings were. That race was just pushing on it. You know what? These are factory set up. And I think I'm going to have to fire, not this guy, but this guy, and double him up with a grade 8. And I bet that'll work. And then I've got two of them in here. Let's see. Here's my bag of grade 8s. Three quarter, three quarter. That looks like the guy. So when this goes in, I want to make sure that everything's all nice and flat on it. So there are a couple ways that these are made. Is All washers are not flat. They're like this. And there's a couple setups you could do. You could do one where the bevels are on the outside and then you can squeeze it. Or you could run it where the bevels are on the inside. But... When the bevels are on the inside, it gives you a little bit of a rock. Can you see the rock in there? I'm going to set it up so it's like this. And then put that guy on there. And we're going to run it. But for now, I'm going to go get that bearing pulled out and get set up. And the bearing's out. These are the ones that are pulled out. And upon inspection of them, found right there. Pretty wore out. How oh, much movement there's in there? Pull one of these new guys over here. Hardly move at all. So, putting the springs in there, setting their preloads, and when they start wearing, it's definitely a sign of your bearings are wore. I'm good with that. Uh, and then there was an option over here where I pre-fit the bearings on. So there were they were really tight going on. Now they're just slightly a slip fit going on. And I had to do some filing on the Detroit press as well as the shaft in order to get it to slide all the way around. All right, so next steps is to install the bearings themselves. So, uh, oh, before I forget, I did some measuring on the springs themselves and how much they're compressed. Earlier I quoted it, it was like 3 sixteenths. No, it's more like 300 thousandths now that I have it apart and was looking at it. So this baby is going to compress 300 thousandths and it's going to put a pretty good load on that inner race, which is probably reasons why they're not spinning. So without further ado, let's get this bearing whacked in there. Let's see if I can do this one-handed. I wonder how good I am. Let's see. Reset, reset. 
Yank it over on this side. Reset again. Look at that. So this is a 111-16 socket. Oh boy, those buggers are in there tight. That's nice. A little high on that side. Oh, maybe we'll just nick it in there. Uh-oh. This isn't working out so good. It turns out it's a one-handed knot operation. Got to put two on there. All right, so in goes the bearing. In goes the spring. So I'm going to run this again. And the next bearing. This one might be a little easier to knock in. It's under a preload. Maybe. Um, I don't have a tripod, so you're going to go dark for a minute. All right, back end, you can see it's in. There's a spring in there. It's hard to see. Wait a minute. Let's see. I got a flashlight around here somewhere. Oh, yeah, I do. Try that. There, you can see the spring now. That's in there, compressed about 300 thousandths, and it's not coming out of the hole as far as the bearing goes because it's a pretty good press fit in there. And then uh, it's off to install. Let's see how this goes. Whether it rolls in there or not, we don't know. This is the first time you see. Let me put you down. I don't know how you want to see this. Probably maybe up, maybe down, maybe not. Look at that. That's something. Those bearings were shot. Watch this. There's not even a preload on this thing. Look at that. No wiggle. Yeah, no wiggle. How cool is that? All right, just in case you want to see this. I'm going to put it in straight, see how it works. Let me buzz that in there real, real quick. This is all part of the fine tuning of how this goes. It spins easy, but you can't really tell how much jiggle is in there or wiggle because it's all under preload already. So what I'm going to do is spin this back out. And I have a couple shims here. Oh, one's at like 32. One's at like 23 thousandths. Uh, another one's at like 32. What was that last one at? 32. So they're both the same. I'm going to put the skinny one in there and see where that one lines up. Now these guys are a, a bit of a bugger. Thank goodness for my grease gun, because I'm going to put a little grease on this. It acts like a little stickum, so the bearing stays in place. Or at least the insert does, until I can get a clamp on it. Do the old shim shake. If there's any dirt in there, you can push it out. I'll tighten that guy up. See where it spins. Well, it looks like I can go a few more because it still spins. I'll pull that out. Two washers. <laughs> so that thin guy wasn't enough. So then this guy is 34. 34, we'll try him. A little more grease. Your old buddy, old pal, old right hand man, lefty. You are in need. Put a little stick them in there. Press that down some more. See where that goes. Now this could go on for a while or I could hit the mark right away. Because I have no idea how far this goes in. 
but I know once it gets tight, I can back it out a little bit with some adjustments. Oh, that's still not, not doing anything. Well, I guess the thin one and the 32 is going to be ideal. Come here, Grace. Let's see what that does. That ought to do a little something. Make sure my washers are still on their bevel. Yep. It's important to have the bevel. Because then when you draw them up tight, they'll both be flat because they can counteract each other. And then you know you got a pretty strong joint as far as how washers go. Spin this guy back. Huh. Uh-oh. Can you hear it? The bearings are working. To me, that's a sign that's just about where it needs to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this the way it is with um, roughly 53 thousandths stuffed in there. And as these new bearings wear in, I will make the adjustment single thicker. But I believe that's about as far as I'd want to go because they're making a little bit of noise now. That means any further, they're going to be grinding pretty good on each other. Studebaker, out.